Hello everyone, welcome to the introduction to deep learning lecture. And today we're going to look at the practical aspects of training neural networks. We've in the recent lectures we heard a lot about the, the theory now. We um, I wanted to start with a quick recap here. So we've talked a lot about how optimization works now, right? Um, specifically we talked about how we use gradient descent for neural networks, right? So we have these um, these layers in the neural network, we have neurons in the neural network, and we have unknown variables in the neural network. And we would like to optimize for the optimal values in order to define our model of the neural network. And in practice, what that is, right, we, um, we basically optimizing here for our weights and for our biases. Again, I'm highlighting always look at the indices, right, we have here three indices for the weights, we have two indices for the biases layer which neuron and which edge that goes into the neuron and here layer and which neuron right so we're optimizing for the w's and the b's these are our model parameters and we're doing this by computing the gradient of f f is the model of the neural network we're differentiating with respect to w and b and we're doing it based on the training sa uh, sample here x and y and and then we had our linear parts, we had our nonlinear parts, we did backpropagation, and based on backpropagation, we could figure out how we compute the derivatives. And this was a little bit complicated and costly when we had um, too many x and y's here, right? When our training set became bigger. In order to make it a bit more um, computationally feasible, um, we introduced the concept of SGD, stochastic gradient descent. And in SGD, um, the idea was that now we have um, our gradient updates here, right? So we have our training set that goes from 1 to m and from 1 to m in the ground truth. Again, here's the input, here's the ground truth label. And the idea is that in SGD, we just, this is not the entire idea of the training set, right? So we're taking just a batch, a mini batch of our training data um, and we're taking, we're subsampling our training set. And in practice, the way we do this is we, we just take a random subset, um, but we make sure um, after um, one epoch, um, we have visited exactly every training sample once, right? So we're not like purely randomizing it in the sense that every time we're drawing a new sample, but instead we, we divide the training set into, into many batches, right? Okay, so this is now the, the gradient with respect to the current mini batch. Um, we have here, this k refers to the kth iteration. And be aware that we need a couple of iterations now um, namely training set size divided by m iterations in order to see every training sample once. That's kind of the idea of SGD, right? So we, we're taking this, um, we're subdividing our training set, right? Um, and we're doing many, many more iterations. And the idea behind it is that, well, if you're taking a large enough m here or a representative m here, um, this, this um, approximate gradient is, is a good estimate of our global gradient, right? And now we've introduced a couple of variations of SGD and the last thing we've discussed in the last lecture was momentum. The idea is that we kind of compute this exponentially weighted average of, of the gradient. So now we have this velocity value. So we're taking the gradient and we're accumulating the velocity here. And then we're doing a velocity update, right? Um, and the idea here was um, with this velocity update, if the gradient always points to the same direction, um, we're kind of accelerating in this direction and if it's always in the same direction, we're just kind of going faster in these directions where the gradients coincide. Um, the other thing we looked at was RMS prop. Um, RMS prop was kind of the opposite and um, this one was uh, downscaling gradients where we have high variance. So what we do here is we're computing the, um, here we're computing kind of the, the variance, so to say, of the gradients, right? So we're computing these um, sum of um, squares, right? Uh, we're doing this on a component-wise basis for the gradients. And then what we do is we simply, we're scaling the gradient with the sum of the squares here, right? Um, and this is the idea. If you have basically a lot of deviation in, in one direction, this division here will be large. So what we're doing is, and practically, is in this case here, we have a lot of fluctuation in the y direction. So the division in the y direction will be larger than the division in x direction, because this is a quadratic term. Um, and the division in, in x will be respectively smaller. So in other words, like this chitter back and forth, we're kind of mitigating. 
um, and we rather want to go into that direction um, to a more straight path towards the minimum here. Okay, this is also, it's the variance of the gradients, right? It's the, the second momentum. And the idea why this helps us in practice, we can then increase the learning rate and we don't diverge anymore. And the very last thing we looked at was Adam. And Adam was kind of this idea that combined these, these two um, ideas. So we have first momentum and we have second momentum, right? So we have here the mean um, of the gradients, right? So we're saying, oh, this is basically the velocity here that we're having this linear weighting between the current gradient and the existing gradient. So we're summing these ones up, right? Then we have the V here, kind of the, the variance. Um, these are the sum of the squares here. Again, we are summing it up and we're having this exponential weighted mean of the squared gradient uh, components uh, and we're summing these ones up too. And then we're doing the update. We, we have this bias correction, um, but at the end of the day, we're essentially taking the velocity here, right? And we're dividing by the variance, right? These are the two ideas of Adam. So we're accelerating in directions where the gradients always point to um, in the history of, of, of the iterations and we are downscaling the ones where the gradient has a high variance. Now, in principle, we have everything we need now to train neural networks. So what we can do is, right, we have our model, we have a way to figure out gradients with, uh, with backpropagation, right, we have SGD in order to find, in order to find good, good model parameters. Now, there's a few things I mentioned always um, in the last lectures was, oh, you have to figure out a few hyperparameters and so on. So one of the biggest hyperparameters now, when, we, when we're using all of these theories now, um, is the learning rate, right? The learning rate is our biggest hyperparameter, and I would like to talk a little bit more specifically about the learning rate here today. And well, the way to debug the learning rate or to think of, or to, to look at what's happening is to look at the training curves. And this one is is only the training data here. Again, there's no learning going on yet. We'll get to this later. Um, we're simply looking at the training loss. Um, these are the epochs here, right? So training starts here, continues here, and this is the loss. So ideally what we would, what we would hope or what we expect is that we have kind of a high loss here at the beginning. And then as we go, right, it goes down and goes down and goes down. And the two implications of the learning rate is if I'm going to have a very low learning rate, I'm going to end up in this, in this bluish curve, right? Because I will go down every step but it will take a while because I didn't set it high enough. And I will later go into this. Um, if you don't set it high uh, enough and it's very low, you will literally train forever. So this one, you won't see the end of your training. So it's very important that it is not um, too low and you can just say, oh, I'm going to just hang around and wait a little bit longer. Yeah, but if, if training time suddenly become weeks and months and, and instead of days, then this is really a big issue. So we have to make sure we're setting actually reasonably um, good parameters here. Okay, if the learning rate um, is high at the beginning, it goes off and down, and then it plateaus. And I wanna, I wanna talk about this one a little bit more. So basically, this one would mean I, I, I'm making good progress at the beginning, but suddenly I'm not going down anymore, even though I could go down more. But the reason why I'm not going down too much anymore is kind of I'm chittering around the, um, yeah, the, the, the optimum. And this is the thing that happens if you, if you have like an energy landscape here, it looks like that, right? Um, what might happen is you start in here, right? Compute gradient, do one step, do another step, uh, do another step, right? Go from here to here, do another step, go here, do another step, go here, right? So in this case, we want to have a high learning rate. And now the problem is now we're pretty close to the optimum. And you see already, right? We would ideally, we would like to refine our learning rate a little bit. But what happens in practice, if you keep the learning rate constants, you're just chittering around this optimum now. And, and, and the problem is we're not going down any further. And this was the thing what I, what I was trying to show here in this curve again. Um, this green curve is when you're high at the beginning and then you, you're not low enough, right? So you're chittering around the optimum. And what could also happen is if our learning rate is too high, it's a very high learning rate, we might even diverge. We might not even converge to, to the right optimum, right? We might even diverge to something um, that is not sensible at all. And, um, um, but this is something fortunately you see very early on. You see like, oh, okay, if, if, if like our loss at the beginning during training doesn't go down, then you, you already know, okay, there's something fishy and we have to debug it. Um, ideally, what we would love to have is we would like to go down quickly at the beginning and then 
you know, it plateaus. This is kind of the good learning rate, a good training curve would look like that. You see, even in this case, the green curve here went down a lot quicker at the beginning. Um, and that is desirable. So I would love to have a good learning rate, a high learning rate here at the beginning. And then I want to have a lower learning rate later on. This is kind of my, my dream scenario. And then of course, right, obviously you want to go and minimize your loss. Your loss means like how well do you explain your current training set? Um, so this is a thing what kind of implies that, oh yeah, if you're having the scenario here, right, we have, when we're far away, we want to make big steps. And when we're closer, we ideally would like to make small steps. And the solution here is to say, oh, we don't just set a single learning rate, but rather we check how close are we to our solution or how long are we in our training process and we modify the learning rate. So basically you start with a high learning rate and then as you continue iterating and training, you're going to go down with your learning rate. And this is a thing what people do and they call it learning rate decay. Um, so they adapt the learning rate as you go. And there's a lot of versions of how to do that. Um, and in this case, alpha is your learning rate, right? So what you're doing is we have here alpha zero, that's our initial learning rate. And what we do is we sim simply say we multiply this alpha with a factor that is smaller than one. So as we go and iterate, um, this value here becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. So the alpha becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, and you what you do is you have one plus a decay rate times an epoch. So basically the larger the epoch, the more epochs you have, the smaller this number here um, and the smaller the learning rate gets. And yeah, in this case, for instance, you can set the decay rate to 1.0, right? Um, alpha zero is 0.1. So in epoch zero, you would have 0.1 as a learning rate. Then in epoch one, you would have um, 0.05, then 0.033, 0.025, and so on. So as you see, yeah, it, go, it goes down and down. So you would get a curve that looks like that, right? Um, and beginning, we have a very high learning rate, and then we, we're going very, 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 uh, making it much lower. And this is a very common scenario that we have actually, that we want to start with a high learning rate and we want to go down with the learning rate later. Um, in practice, what I've just shown you here is just one way of doing learning rate decay, but there's actually many options of how to do that in practice. And another common example what people do is step decay. Step decay means start with alpha minus t times alpha, right? So only every n steps, don't have to do it every time. You basically, um, you subtract half of your learning rate or something like that, right? Um, often t is set to, to 0.5, right? That's a common scenario. Um, of course, it totally depends on your, on your problem. Um, you can also do exponential learning rate decay. So in this case, what you do is you have alpha is equal to t to the power of the epoch times alpha zero, and t has to be a decay rate that is smaller than one, right? So you wanna make sure this value here um, becomes smaller than one. Um, you can do the square root version. Um, alpha is t divided by the square root of the epoch times alpha zero, right? Again, t is the decay rate and so on. So basically you wanna have functions that look something like that, right? So you start with a high learning rate and then it goes down. And typically it goes down actually relatively quickly. Um, there's also some sort of exponential or um, whatever function involved um, because you wanna make sure that at the beginning you fall off very quickly and then you are keeping it relatively constant. And, and the reason is because here the training is much more fine grained and it takes much longer. Um, and if you're going down too, too fast, then you don't make progress later on anymore. But at the beginning you can afford going down uh, much quicker. Okay. Um, so this is in theory what you can do. This is nothing special, right? You just take a few functions and with these functions you're trying to adapt uh, the learning rates respectively. Um, there's also things like training schedules, and this is actually pretty, pretty popular, right? So the idea is that you can go ahead and say, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to train for a certain amount of epochs of that learning rate, then I'm going to train a certain amount of epochs of that learning rate, and so on. So in other words, you manually have a schedule defined for the entirety of the training process, how to set the learning rates. And this takes a lot of effort, right? Um, and it takes also a lot of experience. Uh, in, in practice, how it works is, well, you, you, you just do trial and error, right? You're trying it out, um, seeing this did work, seeing this did, doesn't work. Um, 
trying out, you could make it a little bit easier. You can look at the training curves, right? You could see how do the training curves behave. Um, and based on that, I'm going to set my schedule. But there has to be some manual intervention. There has to be somebody sitting, basically watching your training curve and going down and checking um, what happens. But you'll later see this is maybe not so problematic because you have to check that out anyway, right? You have to check how your training goes. I mean, there's always going to be some bugs in your training and the only way you can figure it out is by looking at your training curves. Um, um, the, the thing is, you need a lot of experience. Um, it generalizes to some degree between different tasks, different methods, different networks. Um, you see it relatively quickly how the training errors behave, right? I mean, the training curves, learning how to read the training curves is super important. And that is something I'm going to go over with later this lecture. Um, but this is something you get a bit of experience, you know, how to set that. And typically the things you consider is, well, how many epochs, how, much tr how big is your training set, network size, and so on. Um, the good news here is, for many, many tasks, people have figured out these training schedules, right? If you're going ahead and want to do, I don't know, try and classify it with ImageNet, right? Have a ResNet architecture, later see what ResNet architectures are. But if you have a standard architecture with ImageNet, training a classifier, people have figured out that for you, right? So it's almost equivalent to getting a trained model versus you getting a training schedule that tells you how to train this specifically. Like these things are more or less equivalent. So you can get your model from the training schedule. Of course, it takes a lot of time still to train it, but at least you know how to do it. Um, so for common tasks, people have done that for you. And that is some sort of a good news. That doesn't mean that, you know, that these things are perfect, but you know, with like popular tasks like classification, people have spent a lot of effort figuring out what good training schedules are. Okay. Um, yeah, this is something you have to probably also gain a little bit of experience yourself. Like you have to see for specific problems, how does my training curve behave and so on. Okay, so now what I like to do is, um, we've talked a lot about the training part right now, right? We talked uh, about the optimization part. We talked about, oh, give me some data, right? Um, and fit your neural network model to it, right? It's nothing else but fitting a model to the data, right? Um, and now, but what we would love to do is, um, we would love to scale this up, of course, right? Um, we have now large data sets. Uh, we have Crown Truth data sets with, with labels, right? This is always what we denote with, with X and Y here. These are our training samples. Um, just for the, for the notation here, we have XI is the ith training image um, with the label YI, so I, ith image, right? Um, often just for the dimensionality, X is much higher dimensional than Y. For classification task, it's very clear, right? If you have an image here that is like, I don't know, has a million pixels um, and you're only going to get uh, a single score vector for each class, is one float, so one float per class basically, depending on what loss you're using. Um, so that is like, typically there's a few orders of magnitude in between. Often you have, in terms of I, we'll see it, it's typically hundreds of thousands, millions maybe, if you're training from scratch. If you're doing fine tuning and transfer learning, that's often the thing you're going to do later, then these things might, might work with a few thousand. But practically training a big network from scratch, right? You typically want to have, I don't know, like twice as many training samples than you have network parameters, right? This is like a rough, a rough rule of thumb. Depends a bit on how much regularization you do and so on. So yeah, if, you, if you're taking a network, you have F, right? You're optimizing for W and B, computing gradients with backprop again, and then we're running our, our favorite uh, SGD variation, and we are getting the quote unquote optimal parameters with respect to whatever we're converging to, right? Um, optimal in a sense that we're probably going to a local optimum. We don't know whether this is a global optimum. And, and there's a lot of analysis. I mentioned this already. Um, the idea behind the neural networks is because they're so high dimensional. Um, if you have so many dimensions, you have always a way to escape and find a good local minimum. And at the end of the day, all these local minima kind of perform all very, very similar. And we'll see this later when we're having different initializations for the W's and the B's. They do converge to very different values, but the performance of the networks is in fact often very, very, very similar. So that's it's kind of a nice thing, right? So basically, no matter what we do, we always converge to something reasonable. And it's not, like, it's not that simple, right? But um, in, in terms of no matter to which local minima we're converging, often this is very similar. Okay, um, great.
Train descent we looked at, right? So we're having this large, large training set with in training samples. We have 1 million label images. We have maybe 500k parameters. I mentioned like this factor of two. This is often something you will see. Um, people often violate it because they just don't have enough training data and they think, oh, let's just make a bigger model anyway. Then you start overfitting, then you have to regularize again. Um, in practice, you, if you want to train properly, right, you want to have enough training data. In practice, sometimes you have to make compromises. If you just don't have enough training images, then, you know, what should you do, right? You, 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 can't, you can't do anything else. Um, yeah, in this case, um, dimensionality-wise, of course, if I have 500k parameters, each gradient will have 500k dimensions, right? I have one partial derivative with respect to each of my network parameters. N will be 1 million, um, and as we know, it's expensive to compute. Um, even in the SGD case, right, even if you do mini batches, you also know the majority of all of the compute is in the gradient computation, right? Um, and this is why GPUs are so great. We'll see later, I'll talk a little bit about it. Um, GPUs are very good at these matrix operations um, and in doing like pure floating point arithmetic operators. And in practice, that's what we map it down to at the end of the day, right? In practice, we're gonna map every layer is gonna be a matrix multiplication, right? And yeah, that, that's something you can very easily map to the GPU. Uh, you can parallelize very efficiently and, and then you can handle these, these massive compute demands um, that we have based on, you know, network sizes, data sizes, and so on. Okay, so, so far, we've only talked about the training part but we did not talk about the actual learning part, right? And learning is now the next step. So now what we have done, right, we only fitted this neural network model to our training set. But learning now means that we generalize to an unknown data set. So far, no real learning has happened. So far, we just fitted this model. Um, so we train an unknown data set and then we, we test with the resulting parameters on an unknown data set. That's typically our validation set, or okay, very at the very end the test data set, right? But we haven't had any 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 learning right now in terms of how we optimize and stuff like that, right? All we have done is we fitted our neural network model to our training data and we try to best explain our training data. And but the idea now between between learning is that we 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 hope, and that's kind of it's literally some hope, <laughs> that our parameters um, that we get from our optimization, they give us similar similar results on different data, on unseen data, right? So if you're optimizing this on a large enough data, or let's put it the other way around, if, we, if we're optimizing our network on a very small training set, right, and our network model is very powerful, then our network will simply memorize all of these things. That's the overfitting case, and then we will probably not generalize. But the idea behind learning is, that I have some sort of operators or some features that the, the operators extract features um, that we're obtaining that are generalizable, meaning that we're feeding so much training data in and we're regularizing enough such that the network cannot simply memorize every single feature, but rather, sorry, every single image or so for classification, but rather has to extract some features that are generalizable, right? like a corner detector and stuff like that. These things are agnostic to a specific sample and can be applied to a larger setting. And this is the thing what, what we hope is going to happen during the learning process, right? Um, of course, in practice, learning means I'm going to fit my model to the training set. I can't do much more. I can do a bit more, right? I can um, check in the validation and so on. Um, but the hope is nonetheless that by optimizing this network on the training set, we will get similar performance on unseen data, right? That's the whole idea. And of course, I gotta make sure when I'm evaluating it that I don't mix up my data, right? Of course, I don't wanna accidentally evaluate on my, on my train set and say, oh, look, we're doing great. You have to, you have to take new data. Um, the expectation is, of course, that there will be some gap, right? There will be some generalization gap. So we won't, we won't perfectly match the performance on the training set. Um, but I'll get to this in a second. Okay, but when we're talking about learning, right? What we have is we have our training set, we train our neural network on the training set. We have our validation set. We do hyperparameter optimization and we check the generalization. So validation set is very, very critical actually. We need a validation set uh, in order to check the progress of our training. And I'll show you a couple of training curves in a, in a few slides, but it's very, very critical that we have a validation set to consistently monitor how well do we do in terms of generalization. 
If we're not doing so well, we have to figure out hyperparameters. We have to check these ones. Um, we have to check the generalization process. We have to check, hmm, do we have enough data? Do we have, do we have the right model? Do we have the right architecture? And of course, you know, do, do, did we optimize it well? Um, yeah, we also have the test set. Um, I've mentioned this a couple of times, only at the very end. Never touch the test set during development and training. Right? The most common mistake people make, they're gonna use, um, they're gonna use the test set um, during your loop when you evaluate, right? It's, it's like, oh yeah, it didn't work so well on my test set. I'm just gonna redo my model and I'm gonna do it as many times until my test set is good. So you have this outer loop of redoing in order to, to kind of cheat and, and, and use the train, uh, test information during training. Um, of course, if you do this in a practical application, like let's say you have your, your AI startup, everybody should do an AI startup, of course. If you're doing an AI startup and you're doing this, then you will very quickly see, oh, you can show good results on paper, but of course these results are all on paper because they will never generalize to practice. So this is a very big thing that never do this in practice, right? Okay, um, terrible splits, training set 60, 20, 20, standard thing 80, 10, 10. It depends a little bit on the data. You can put it more extreme. You can do 95, five. Uh, it, it depends a little bit. Um, Basically, you want to have a large enough validation set to get some meaningful answers here, right? If you don't, uh, yeah, if you don't do that, that that will be um, a bit of a, a problem and an issue, right? Okay. Uh, in practice, you want to have a large enough training set because that's going to determine how how good of a model you can optimize, and also you want to have a reasonably sized test set. Otherwise, you you can't tell at the end of the day whether stuff works. Um, what you're doing during training is the training error. So when I'm going to tell you, oh, check your training error, and I'm going to do this all the time because that's the first thing you're going to do, is whenever you're running a, a mini batch update, right, you're checking in the forward pass in order to compute the gradients, um, you can check the error here. This is from the average mini batch error. You're going to get your training error, and this is how you're plotting your curve. Like the training curves you've seen before are basically by taking all of the um, the gradients per mini batch, right? You're evaluating the loss at the same time, um, and you're averaging this loss, um, and this is what the, the 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 training error is going to look like, right? And so you have this jittery curve for every mini batch. You're going to get probably one value, uh, and, and then you smooth it a little bit, and that's going to get you a training curve. During training, this is a very important thing. Not everybody does that, and um, but I think people should also do the same for the validation set. So. One thing I can do, of course, is I can um, I can say after every epoch, I'm going to run my entire validation set and I'm going to evaluate it and I'm going to get some evaluation error. But for a loss curve, that's too late. Like waiting a full epoch for some feedback for the validation is, is terrible. It's way too late. I, like I have to wait possibly a few hours to get even a single, a single point, a single data point from a validation set. So for the validation set, you typically do the same thing. Um, so you also kind of divide your validation into a bunch of batches, so to say, or into subsets. Um, you don't need to compute gradients, of course, but you still want to evaluate the loss function every n iterations for a couple of these subsets of the validation set, right? And then you can plot a similar curve than training for validation. Um, in practice, I've heard a lot of things why people don't do it, like, oh, it's too expensive, you don't want to do that. But I can assure you the forward pass here is nothing compared to the backward pass. The backward pass here dominates everything. In the training, the backward pass is like at least a factor of, I don't know, 20, 50 or so more computationally expensive than the forward pass. So every n iterations evaluating a forward pass for a bunch of validation sample is costing you absolutely nothing. Um, and this is very valuable information though. So maybe you're increasing your training time by like half a percent or so. Um, but you're going to get valuable information that will save you weeks and, and weeks in, in terms of debugging time. Okay, um, so this is one thing that is very important actually, that you're debugging both training and validation. Um, yeah, I mentioned the, the splitting of the data, right? Um, what's very important here is in this basic recipe of machine learning. If I'm going to go ahead, I have basically, I have several, I have several scenarios, right? I have some ground truth data, I have some training data, um, and this, I want to fit my training model to it. And I'm going to get some, um, some errors in each of these steps, right? And this is something um, <laughs> that, that is very interesting. So you're going to have several different errors you can get during the whole machine learning process. 
Um, let's start with the simplest error, the ground truth error. You would say, well, what, what the hell, there's a ground truth error? It's the ground truth, that's the thing what always is right. Um, from a network perspective, yes, that is true. Um, but from a practical perspective, if I'm going to ask, um, you know, a bunch of students to, to annotate 10 million images, at some point they might get a little bit lazy, a little bit boring, um, a board, and, and then they may, might make some mistakes when they're annotating the ground truth data. So in practice, you're going to have some error in your ground truth data too. So your ground truth data is never going to be 100% perfect. There might be some outliers in the ground truth data and so on. So that's something you should always consider, like what data set are you using, right? So what, what's the, um, yeah, what's the bottom line there? And um, we also, th let's say, let's say this is a simple, this is a fictional number here. Let's say 1% of my labels are wrong. Um, this is a realistic example, probably. Um, and now if you're fitting your model to this ground truth data, you will, of course, not perfectly fit this model to the ground truth data. So there's going to be some sort of some sort of bias in between, right? Um, and this bias is the underfitting part, right? So, and, and of course, this is one percent. If this is one percent, this will be naturally higher because my model cannot be perfectly fit, right? So this part is the underfitting part. When I, I want to figure out how closely can I fit my my neural network. How, how well can my neural network explain my training data, right? It's not gonna be perfect. The training error will not be zero. If it's gonna be zero, you did something wrong probably. <laughs> um, but if you have a realistic training sample with enough images or with enough uh, training samples, um, you're gonna not be perfect, right? So you're gonna have some error here um, in the underfitting. And I can minimize that error. I can, can make it smaller by having a bigger network, right? If my network is infinitely big, I can basically memorize the entirety of the training set. Um, if that happened, then I would have no underfitting. That would be great from a training perspective. But I have the second part here when I go from my training to my validation and tested error. And that's actually the learning part now. This is the generalization gap. Um, here I'm going to have the overfitting issue, right? Basically, if this model here is too good or memorizes the whole training set, I will probably have a very high validation error. And again, in practice, this error here is even higher than this one, of course, right? Like, this is my ground truth data. I'm fitting a model to the ground truth data, and then I have another data set that I haven't really seen yet, um, but it's similar from a distribution on that one. But of course, since I haven't seen it, I'm expecting it to perform a little bit worse. So I have still some generalization gap in here, right? Um, and this, this is the thing that you can always see in all the machine learning courses and so on. Like, yeah, of course, you have some error in the training data, Fitting the model has some error, and then also the generalization gap is even making it a little bit worse, right? Um, so this is like a very typical example. And, but based on these insights, we have some, some, um, some knobs to play around with, right? I can go ahead and say, oh, I, I, I have hyperparameters I can deal with. I can have models, model sizes I can deal with, right? Learning parameters, stuff like that. Um, and this leads me to, to the very basic concept of when you're designing your own neural network, right? When you wanted to start uh, training your own neural network. Um, in practice, you're going to start very simple. You're always going to start with the training. Um, you're going to try to get the training error down. This is the, num one, the number one thing you're trying to do, right? Um, if your training error is high, what do you do? Well, you have maybe a bigger model, you train longer, different architecture, different hyperparameters, different learning rates, right? Learning rate is always a thing, like my training doesn't converge. Maybe my learning rate was too high, that's the naive thing. Um, most of the time you simply have a box number in your data auto or so. Um, but in practice, you know, yeah, like training error, if it's high, you check this one first. You don't even have to evaluate. Training error has to go down. Um, so assuming my training error goes down, then I think, good, ch check box one is fulfilled. Then I am, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm checking if my, what my generalization data is doing, right? So if, if I basically have now um, high error on, if this gap between training and, and, and validation is high, um, then I'm overfitting. This is the standard overfitting scenario here. Um, if that is high, what do we do? We can do more data, regularization, new model architecture. So maybe I can make a smaller model now, then I don't, I don't overfit so much anymore. And you can already see these two things conflict, right? This one needs a bigger model and this one would need a smaller model in order to less overfit. So 
there's a very delicate balance. Practically what you do is you want to use a very big model, but with a bigger model, you probably also need more data. Yeah, you can probably balance it out with a bit of regularization. But in practice, you want to make the training hard enough such that you don't overfit, right? Um, so otherwise you get this, this one here, right? Okay, um, if, the, if the validation error then is still too high, right? Um, so one thing that might also happen is if both of them are too high. <laughs> um, if you're doing too much regularization, of course, you're making this one here worse again. Um, then you have to go back and you have to check this one again. And this is kind of this idea then if you're saying, oh, my, if my, my validation error is too high, um, yeah, then you, you, you have to think about it, right? You have to check, oh, more training data. One thing is a lot interesting is more data augmentation. That's one thing we're gonna talk a little bit about, talking about domain adaptation, stuff like that. But typically the problem here is that the training test data is mismatching, right? Typically the distribution here um, could be different. Um, if my test error, this is the thing I do at the very end, if that one is then too high, um, yeah, that's not so ideal. Ideally you wanna test only once, right? So then you, you have to basically start over again. Okay. Um, in practice, you've seen this curve here, right? You have seen this, this over and underfitting idea. Um, the idea is that with enough regularization and with enough of, of structure in the network, and you later see convolutional operators, um, I can basically have like this nicely regularized curve that is to the best of its ability splitting the training and the validation set apart, uh, <laughs> the classes in the, in the data apart. Um, Whereas if you have the underfitting case, then you have just a line here, for instance, then you can't split it apart. In the overfitted case, you would like every single sample would be memorized. In this case, you would expect not a whole lot of, uh, not a lot of generalization, right? Good. Um, yeah, overfitting and underfitting is a thing we will talk a lot about, right? Um, again, if you're having here uh, training, right? If you're training, if you're having a big enough model, and this is also very delicate, right? If you basically say my model is very big and I know my model could in principle memorize more things, my training error here goes down, 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 right? But my validation error will eventually go up again. And the reason it goes up is because my model is so powerful, it could just memorize each training sample because that's better for the training error. Well, it gives you a lower training error, that's why it's optimized, it will do it. Um, but unfortunately, at some point, you don't generalize so well anymore. So, so one thing you can do is you can simply say, oh, we're gonna stop here in the middle. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an idea called early stopping. So if you monitor both curves, you can see uh, I'm gonna stop here in, um, yeah, somewhere in the middle where I have kind of the optimal, the best validation error. That's one thing you can do. Okay, um, you've seen a couple of these curves right now and I wanted to push this a little bit more. Um, like from my end, like, when I'm advising students and so on, the first thing I'm telling everyone, oh, oh go ahead and set up your uh, training curve visualizations. That's just such an important thing because that's literally the only debugging tool you have at hand. Otherwise, you, you don't know really what's happening. Um, and I wanted to, to discuss a little bit about what are good, what are bad training curves, what are the things you need to look at. Um, of course, you, when you do this yourself, you will, you will get a bit of a better feeling eventually too, right? Um, but I would, I would like to go over that and I would like to show you, you know, how these curves could, poten could potentially look at. So typically what you see is you see curves like these ones. Um, and what do we see here? Well, we have here, um, of course, I'm missing the axis labels right now. Um, you see here the iterations, you hear, uh, in this case, you see the, the accuracy. You see here the training loss, in this case, the training loss. Um, you see here the iteration. So you have one curve each, you have an accuracy that goes up and the loss should go down. Accuracy, it's classification accuracy whatsoever. Um, but let's have a look at the loss function here. This is a train graph, meaning that, oh yeah, okay, we have only one curve right now in this graph. Um, the loss starts very high and the loss goes down. So what can we see about this curve? Well, we can see this green line here and we see also this, you see this in the background, this like, light transparent green, right? So practically what you do is you evaluate your loss after every mini batch, right? You do it anyway, because you have to do it for the, for the backward pass. For the backward pass, you need forward first, otherwise you can't do backward. Um, and you're getting the loss here for free for every batch. And now the problem is, of course, this is very noisy because my batches might be very small. So what you have to do is you have to make big, bigger batches. And 
well, bigger batches is not always possible because they don't fit on the GPU. So in practice, you just distribute it over more batches. But the evaluation of every batch will be very noisy. So you're gonna get these like very high variance, like this light greenish result here is the raw evaluation. And this might, this might even fluctuate much more. And then what you do is you're smoothing the curve. So you apply your favorite um, smoothing function on the curve, right? You're just taking some sort of exponential average here um, in order to get some smoothing function. This is what the, what the dark green curve here is. Same thing here for the accuracy. You see the accuracy here fluctuates quite a bit. Um, and, and that's normal. That's it's just how the training goes. It's SGD, right? We're having a lot of randomness involved here. So of course, because of that, we fluctuate. Um, so this is how these curves are being created. Um, now, what do the curves mean? Um, so let's have a look here. Um, well, typically what you would expect is that the curves at the beginning, they start with a very high loss. Um, that's not our achievement. That's just literally, if you have a random initialization of the neural network weights, your curves start with a high loss, right? Um, that's normal so far. But the assumption is after a few iterations, this loss should in principle go down very quickly, actually. Um, this one going down also should lead on the inverse side, on the accuracy, the accuracy should go up relatively quickly too at the beginning, right? So at the beginning, you should, should see a lot of notable changes here. And in a sense, that's good news for us because that means I don't have to wait all the way at the very end to, to tell if this is potentially working or not. But I could, um, I could just basically, if I chopped off this graph here, right? I'm here at 0.002, it's like, at one fourth of the training time, basically, I already know literally if this is a good development or not, right? Um, I can't even do it here, right? I see, I see if it's going down. So that one I see very quickly. Typically, you see this after minutes. You don't have to wait too long, right? And and that's a very important thing um, to to kind of you know memorize that you need to look at this very early in order not to waste too much time waiting to be here. Okay, but. Now let's evaluate a little bit further. So what we see is, oh, it goes down, it goes down, it goes down. Um, and, you know, it fluctuates still, it goes down, it goes down, it goes down. Um, you even see, well, here, it's still even going a little bit down, I would say, right? Um, I don't know it exactly here. I would, I would probably want to zoom in a little bit. Um, maybe it, it could still train even a little bit longer, right? If you train this maybe a little longer, it goes even down a bit further. Um, the other thing, however, you see is like after here, like it goes down much slower. So if it goes down much lower, the one thing you would typically do is possibly change the learning, change the learning rate, make the learning rate smaller. That's typically a very good thing here. Um, when it doesn't go down anymore, try making the learning rate smaller. That's always a good idea. Um, worst case, it doesn't go down at all anymore. That's okay, then you're as far as before, but you're, you're not destroying anything. Um, but best case, sometimes it still goes a little bit down and you can train you know, a little bit longer. So in principle, I would say this is a very, it's a good learning curve here, right? This is a very, a very successful, very successful training run. I don't know how well this generalizes. I have not looked at the validation set, but I know my training loss goes down and my training accuracy here goes up. It goes even up further, right? So if you look here, it still goes up a little bit. So that's a good thing. Um, and this is kind of like a good curve what you would expect. Um, you see multiple other visualizations. Um, you see other visualizations that look like these ones here. Um, let's have a look at this one here first. This one is a very interesting one. Um, what can we see here? Um, again, epochs, loss, you see a bunch of fluctuation. Um, in this case, already we see training and validation set is plotted into the same curve. Um, this is something I would always do. Um, always make sure you plot them at the same time. Um, you see here, the training loss is lower than the validation loss. Validation loss is a little bit higher. That's the norm. This is what you would expect. Um, both of them go down. You see here, the gap is very small. The gap here is a little bit bigger. Um, what do we see here? Well, the loss at the beginning goes down very quickly. Um, the loss goes down even further. We definitely are not done with the training here. Both training and validation still go down here. So we could train longer, right? Um, probably don't have to adjust the learning rate yet here because it's still going down at a, at a very good pace. Um, so that's typically how you visualize both training and validation. Um, here is another example, again, training validation, that goes both down, go down here. Um, there's still an interesting difference between these two curves, right? They look very different and they also, <laughs> they also have a different implication. Again, I'm not looking at the problem, I'm just looking at the training process. So for that problem here, um, 
you see it goes down at the beginning, but then it goes down in a linear fashion. So typically, if you're going back, you want to actually, this is a more realistic curve here. Um, what this one means is probably my learning rate here at the beginning could have been a little bit higher, right? Then I would have gone a little bit down a, a bit faster. Right? It would have probably like went like that. That would be a bit of a nicer training curve. Um, depends a little bit. You can play around with that, but if you see that, typically the learning rate has to go a little bit up and then it goes down. Um, here, what you see is, well, I started high on my training, I went down, and then I, I stayed down there, but it hardly moved here. This is kind of the opposite thing. In this case, you would argue, oh, the learning rate here probably was very high, and here it stayed too high and didn't go down anymore. If you're going down at the very beginning, um, often the learning rate could go a little bit higher. There could be other reasons why that happens. Um, this is often what happens if, this is often a problematic case when it goes down very, very quickly at the beginning and then doesn't move anymore. That means, oh, you're not learning so much probably. You're just doing some, I don't know, maybe optimizing for some average or something like that. But in practice, this is also not such an ideal curve. It doesn't fail also, right? I'm just trying to say, this is from your whole model performance. You would expect it's going down more in a more continuous way, right? More like this, right? Um, it's just something depends on the problem. But if you go down very quickly at the beginning, before you even re... Sometimes I see when, when, when the loss goes down basically to a, to a plateau, before you even reach one epoch, then something is often a bit fishy, right? Either learning rate was too big, or your, your data is a bit inconsistent, it's just getting some mean output or so. That's often what you're getting there. Um, yeah, so you also see the classical failure cases. I mean, not failure cases, but you see classical cases. Um, in this case, we see overfitting curves, right? Again, we see here training goes down, validation goes down a little bit, but then actually goes up again. This is like a classic, a classic case of overfitting, right? Um, again, what do we do? Well, we go back to the drawing board, make maybe the model a little bit smaller, regularize more, have more data and so on. These are the standard things you would do. Um, same thing here, goes down, validation also goes down, and then these two things here, they separate out. In this case, the validation doesn't go down too much, but uh, it doesn't go up too much at least here, it goes even up. Um, depends a little bit how much you're overfitting. Um, what's common is that you have a lot of fluctuation early on. Like at the earlier, at the early training, you're gonna typically have a lot of fluctuation. Um, okay, but yeah, in practice, you're gonna have this issue that you have to deal with when you have these overfitting cases. Um, yeah, I mean, you have a bunch of tools now at hand, you can look at these. Um, yeah, there's other types of cur uh, curves, what you're getting. Um, you have underfitting problems in this case. Yeah, this is unusual, right? Like typically you would expect to go this way. In this case, it goes down slowly and then it goes down faster. That's kind of a bit of a strange behavior. It's like a specific case of underfitting. Uh, loss is still decreasing, probably have to train longer. Um, yeah, the other problem, what you're going to have here is suddenly um, the validation loss here is in both cases lower than the training loss, which is a very fishy problem. Like here, it's very extreme, right? Here, your validation set is basically always much lower. Like it's, this is 0.4-ish than here, and this is 0.2-ish. There's like a massive difference between these two, right? Um, yeah, this is a practical issue. So you have, you have to think about what to do in this case. Um, typically, there's two alternatives why that happens. Um, first thing is you simply have a bug, right? Most of the time, it's just, oh, your evaluation is wrong, you're evaluating the curves in the wrong way, validation is somewhat multiplied with a different factor, and so on. Um, that's the most common case. The other common case, it's also common case, is that your validation data is much, much, much simpler. So let's say I'm gonna train a classification problem, right? I'm gonna train on 10 different images, uh, image classes, and this one is just a single class. So it's like very misdistributed. If my validation set is so much easier than my training set, uh, and this happens to be a class that my model is very good at learning, or it's very easy to recognize, then my validation error will be lower. Um, so this is a, a really problematic thing. It's good that you catch it early because that would mean your training set, uh, your validation set doesn't really tell you how well the model is working, right? It evaluates something different. Like ideally the training and the validation, well not ideally, but the training and the validation set should come from a similar distribution, ideally an identical distribution. 
if that's not the case, you end up in situations like these. That's something you have to you have to look out very carefully. Um, yeah, I also, when I, again, when I'm advising students, often see that and then they tell me, oh, yeah, it's going down. I'm like, yeah, but you should probably figure out first what's going wrong there, right? If you don't understand um, why that happens, there's there's something fishy about it, and, and, and this will, will just bite you in the ass later, right? That, that's a big problem. Um, so, again, like two things here. Either you're going to have misdistributed data, check out that the training and the data is correct, right? Um, or you simply have a bug in the evaluation in, in, in your code, right? Um, that's also very, very common. Okay, um, so to summarize here, um, well, we have these, we have these training curves um, and you should probably look at them. Um, we have underfilling cases, training validation losses decrease, and they would even decrease more, right? We have the overfitting cases where training loss decreases and validation loss increases. Or, well, overfitting could mean validation goes down a little bit first and then it goes up again, right? So this is like, this is a standard overfitting case. This is like standard thing that will happen. Um, often what you do is you start simple and with a small model, then you see that, and then you throw more data at it, right? If you get there, then, you, then it's time to throw more data at it. Okay, um, yeah, so the ideal training, the, there's a small gap between training and validation loss. Both go down. Same stable way, there's not a lot of fluctuations, maybe, maybe, maybe a little bit at the beginning, but, but otherwise not. Okay, this is like the standard um, things we wanted to look at. Um, there's like the bad signs and bad practices. <laughs> um, so bad signs is if, so let, let's start simple again, right? First thing we have to check, does my training error go down? If my training error doesn't go down, I have to debug this first. There's no point in looking at anything else. Training error has to go down. Once I made sure my training error goes down, I'm looking at my validation error. Um, if my validation error and the training error go down, that's already pretty good. Um, then I'm going to check out the details. Then I'm going to check, oh, does my, is my validation error actually lower, than, uh, higher than my training error? If not, there's also something fishy. Um, test on different train set during training. Yeah, yeah, it could happen. Um, the other thing is what's very common, what I've seen also all the time, training set contains test data. This is like common, common problem. Oh, I messed up some problem. I mixed up my data and I have a bunch of my, my samples in the training set, uh, in, the, in, the, in the test set that we're in the training set. Um, and the other thing is, of course, people debug the algorithms on the test data. Never touch during training anything um, that is part of the test. That's very important. Um, it's also a little bit, this is very critical here, right? Um, if you, for instance, doing image classification and you're having images that are taken from similar environments, you also want to make sure that your splits are based on the environments, right? You can't make, you can't have related images from a similar environment, um, one in train and one in test. That would be violating the whole idea. Okay, but I hope, I hope you get this point, right? You have to make, you have to be pretty strict how you set up the experiments, otherwise your entire evaluation is kind of flawed. That means like, oh, you're showing good results, but in fact, your model is, is overfitting and you don't know it, right? Okay. Um, we've talked now a lot about hyperparameters and I've told you a little bit, for instance, how to deal with learning rate, right? We've seen a few things like solar parameters, learning rate decay, stuff like that. Um, but there's of course a lot of hyperparameters and basically everything that is not a model parameter is in fact a hyperparameter, right? Network architecture, number of layers, number of weights, Number of iterations, learning rates, that one we talked about, regularization, we talked a little bit about it, we'll talk a bit more next lecture, batch sizes, very critical thing. Um, so overall, anything that is the learning setup and the optimization is going to be part of the hyperparameters, basically everything that is not the model parameters itself. So the question is, how do we find good hyperparameters? I mean, for the learning rate, we checked it out a little bit, right? Um, we can manually do it. We can just look at uh, at the curves. And this is when we're talking about hyperparameter tuning. The most common thing is we check the training curve. Is it going down? If not, we're gonna figure stuff out, right? And so on. Um, there are things like grid search that's more structured. Um, um, well, we define this range of all parameters, right? Um, we have some sort of pseudo uniform distribution over these parameters, we try it out costly because we have to train every time. 
Um, there's random search. It's like grid search, but pick the points at random in predefined ranges. There's things like stratified sampling and stuff like that. That makes it a little bit more structured when you have still some randomness involved and you're not bound to these grid patterns. In practice, you do some, some combination of the two, right? You do some pseudo random pattern that is kind of a grid, but still random, right? So you're aligned, you have like a Gaussian around the grid or stratified sampling is very common, for instance. Okay, these are very common things um, that people do there. Um, yeah, these two things, very, very costly. Because every time you have to, <laughs> one sample point here means one training process and that's gonna cost you a lot of time. Um, in practice, how do you do this? Well, in practice you don't train maybe at the very end, you just train parts of it. And, and then once you've trained it um, and you know it's going to behave better, um, then you, you stop the training process and you kind of refine your choices. And practically what you do then is if you look manually at it, you just overlay all your all your curves into single graphs. So you check which is the best rotation curve, right? That's that's typically the thing. Okay, this is the hyperparameter tuning part. Um, I also wanted to go a little bit of a, a different step back. Um, how do we start at the very beginning? So, like, let's say I'm gonna you're doing a I don't know guy research a thesis with us or so. The very first thing I'm gonna tell you is you should start training with a single training sample, right? Let's say I'm having an image of a dog and I want to memorize that this is a dog. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to load this image into my data loader. Um, I'm going to run my network and I'm going to predict all this dog. It's only one image right now. And you check that this output is correct. This is a very simple debugging step um, you're doing. Um, and you do this before you do anything else. You typically do that very simple step first. Um, of course, you're going to horrendously overfit, but in this case, overfitting is a good thing because you expect that the training accuracy should be 100% because you just memorized that input. Um, if you're only taking a single training sample, the fun thing is the input doesn't matter because your network will always predict the same label. It will always predict dog no matter what the input was. In this case, in a sense, you're not debugging the input but you're debugging your loss function, right? You're saying, oh, does my loss function do anything? Does it go down and can I optimize for that? So in order now to debug the input as well, what we're doing is, well, we're simply using a couple of training samples. So let's say we're using four training samples. So we're going from one dog to four dogs. Um, I wouldn't do four dogs. I would do a little bit of variation here, right? Um, so we have more than one class. Um, in this case, the network will make, have to make independent predictions based on the input. So the network is, of course, still powerful enough to memorize four samples, right? It's still completely overfitting. But the key difference is now that in this case, we're going to have multiple images and the input of the image is associated with the label. In other words, the network has to figure out this and that input image were different and then associate the right label to it. It doesn't have to learn any features yet, it's still memorizing. But in this case, kind of when you're having four samples, you're debugging that your data loader at the input is correct. Or well, not correct maybe, but at least you're debugging that your input loader can differentiate between two images, right? Um, again, in this case, your accuracy should also be 100%, um, but you're debugging a little bit more, okay? Uh, these two things, don't take a lot of time. Overfitting here should take seconds. Overfitting here should take seconds, maybe minutes, but seconds to minutes at most. If this doesn't take seconds to minutes, something is horrendously wrong. Um, again, I've seen this so many times that people train a neural network before debugging the very basic things and letting it run for like a week, and there's no intermediate feedback. This is a waste of a week of time. You should go ahead and first debug single samples first and make sure your training process is set up. You set up your training curves, you check that part out first. Okay, now once these two checkpoints, like I can overfit to one sample, I can overfit to four different samples, then I'm gonna add more data, right? Then I'm gonna go five, 10, 100, 1,000. At some point, I'm not arguing yet here that you should go ahead and see some, oh, I, I'm gonna see some really good results yet. The very next step here is that if I'm plotting my training and my validation curves, I would like to see some variation or some, some motion in terms of the downward trend on my validation curve. 
I'm still expecting hard overfitting here in like a thousand samples here. Of course, it's a really small data set, right? But what I would expect is that my validation curve at some point goes a little bit down before it goes up again, right? Um, that is very important, right? So like at some point you're moving from overfitting to more samples. And even if you're going to like a thousand or maybe 10,000 here, this should be a matter of minutes to debug. So seeing that the validation curve goes a little bit down is still something you should see in a matter of minutes, like not hours or days, right? So even if complicated models with a smaller data set size, you could see that there's some channelization between training and validation happening. So all of these things here, um, they don't give you good results yet, but they're very, very useful for setting up your own training processes. And this is very, very critical when you, when you, especially when you're new to neural networks. But even when you, anybody who has done neural networks for a while, they know this in and out. They always start like that, right? They, they've done this already. They wouldn't come to this crazy idea and like, oh, I'm training like a really big network from scratch without debugging all of these simple steps. They always start like that. But they know how to do it so quickly. It takes them like 10, 20 minutes. Then they know the network is set up correctly. And then they can spend a lot of time on like, you know, architecture tuning and stuff like that. Um, yeah, finding good learning rate, we've discussed this a little bit. Um, I don't know, good learning rates to try is depends on the problem, of course. It's 10 to the power of minus 1 to 10 to the power of minus 4. Um, typically, loss should look something like that, right? Typically, what you care about is you want to make sure that the loss drops significantly at the beginning. Um, if the loss doesn't go down at the beginning, you're pretty, like, things are wrong, right? Then, then things don't work out. Um, that's something you should do very, very much at the beginning, right? Um, yeah, so that's typically looking at the training curves. I think it's the easiest way here, looking at the validation curve then later. But typically, if learning rate, you can decide based on the training curves, right? Um, yeah, the grid search. Yeah, we talked a little bit about it already. I don't know, in practice, um, <laughs> I, have, I have to be honest, I think practically, like if you're doing your own research projects right now, grid search and stuff like this is often out of the compute budget. Um, you're doing it more on your own at the very end. You're taking like an existing model that is already pre-trained and then you're fine tuning from specific cases, right? You don't always have to start from scratch. Um, like different learning rates, right? You can try this at the end. You train a model, it converges, then you see you try reducing the learning rate. Typically, if it goes down further, then you continue. If not, you don't, right? Um, yeah, choose a few values um, and weight decay around the bird, um, train a few models for a few epochs, and then you see what happens. Um, in industry applications, people always do grid search, right? Because for them, like every percent matters at the end. Um, there's a couple of things. You can refine the grid, pick best models you found on the grid, so the course grid, and then have like a local, smaller, refined grid. Um, you do kind of this hierarchical fashion, um, refine grid search around these steps, train them longer 10 to 20 epochs without the learning rate decay. Um, if it goes down, then good. If it doesn't go down, like kill the experiment, right? So the whole idea of this whole hyperparameter tuning then at the end um, is, yeah, it's, it's, mostly, it's mostly a way to figure out which experiments do you have to run longer and which experiments do you kill early. These are the two things you care about most, right? Um, yeah, what I would say, in terms of the, in terms of for you to set up stuff, don't worry too much about hyperparameter optimization. Just worry about stuff to get it working to begin with, and then you can you can do the, like you know making your model better and better. But first you have to figure out your own models, um, and this is often a very it's very challenging. <laughs> and I think one reason is also that um, a lot of the code is online now, and people can just download it. Um, it's actually a bit of an artifact of the community. I mean, it's so easy accessible, you can make a lot of progress very quickly, but it often takes away the deeper understanding, right? So it often makes sense that you're going ahead and implementing these things yourself first. I mean, that's what we're doing in this course right now. You're basically writing your own optimizer first and stuff like that, and you're training your own networks first. And we hope that this helps you a little bit to, to, to get these insights. Okay, um, one thing that is very critical, so for people who have been doing neural networks for quite a while, they're very good at engineering and bookkeeping. In other words, they know they're running a bunch of experiments and they have hypotheses for each experiment. Um, and then they get like answers, should I do this more? Should I do this not so more and so on? 
And one thing they're particularly good at is they're very good at keeping track of timings. Um, and, and that's always very, very important. Like, first of all, on one hand, you have to understand how long does my current stuff take to train? Um, I mean, timings is everything. The faster I get to results, the earlier I can say is everything is set up or not. That's why I'm starting simple. Like, that's why I'm overfitting to single training sample first, right? I want to see if I overfit. I don't want to wait two weeks to train the whole network to realize, oh, I made a bug in my data loader, right? I want to do this very early on. Uh, I want to take seconds and not weeks, right? Um, what I would always recommend is when you're implementing this stuff, get your, get your timings. Um, check your, your PyTorch or TensorFlow code, you know, check where's the performance bottleneck right now. Typically, the bottleneck should be in the backward pass. Often it's in the data loading pass. If it's in the data loading pass, mostly you're doing something wrong. Um, there's, a bit of a, there's a bit of an understanding of the hardware you're training on. Um, and this is very important actually, right? Um, so typically what you say is like, oh, if an iteration takes like longer than half a second, then, then things get dicey. At the beginning, you have smaller networks, even like smaller architectures, start always small. Um, then you should be on the 100 milliseconds mostly for classification tasks. But anyway, get precise timings and check that the timings are reasonable for the model capacity and stuff like this, right? And then you have to understand your hardware. Um, what servers are you training this stuff on, right? Is, so you have basically different, different levels of storage. You have stuff that is on the GPU um, that's been called by the, by the kernels and stuff like this, by the CUDA kernels eventually. Um, there's even like, there's even different <laughs> memory layers on the GPU, of course. You have registers, you have shared memory, you have global memory. Probably don't know, need to know all of this right now. If you're going deeper into like implementing your own layers, you probably would need to. But practically for you, what's most important is anything on the GPU, right? Is it in the GPU memory? Um, the next thing would be, is it in RAM? Is it in the CPU RAM? Then afterwards you have it on, an, on, a, on a hard drive. And the hard drive could be either an SSD or it could be an HDD, right? And all of these things, what I just described, there's typically an order of magnitude in terms of, of, of performance, right? So the slowest thing is typically an HDD, right? If you just have um, a standard hard drive, that's typically not very fast, right? You, have, you, you can read, but it's, it's, I don't know, what is it like 10, 20 max a second or so? It's, it's not super fast. SSD is on order of magnitude faster, right? Then RAM is like already a big jump. Um, and then the GPU is like another like order of magnitude faster, right? Because that's locally directly at the compute units, right? Um, so that's something to consider, like where's your data, which one is bottlenecked? Um, but important thing, look for the bottlenecks. There's no point in optimizing your data loader when you're totally stuck in the back propagation paths, right? Um, or there's no, optimize, there's no issue in optimizing back propagation when your data loader is too slow. Um, again, data engineering, how to set up a deep learning server, that's also an art by itself, right? Um, a lot of times what you see these days is that people train remotely. And by train remotely, what that means is you have one server that has the GPUs and another server that has the SSDs. Um, we're doing this too, for instance, in my lab now. Um, this is a, a convenience because you only have one SSD server with like, I don't know, like 30, 40 terabyte or so. Um, and then everybody reads from the server, but of course you have the network latency in between. And now very importantly, what you have to do is you have to make sure you have the right caching and prefetching of the data and so on. You have to make sure there's no, no data bottleneck. Also, don't always complain about the hardware. Think about how can you deal the best with the current hardware. That's really the key. Like people always tell me, I don't have enough GPU memory. And they tell me this is no matter which GPU they have. If you're starting deep learning stuff, if you have a two gig GPU, you can start very easily. You can do most of the stuff yourself. Like most of the models you can train with that. Bigger models give you a few percent, but they don't make or break the models, right? That's a, that's a big thing. Um, very importantly, estimate your times. Like, how do you expect your training curves to go? How do you expect your validation curves to go? How long till conversions and stuff like that? This estimate, super important. A lot of people, I see this unfortunately also, is they just start a process and they have no clue when they expect any results. So when do you have to check again? That's, that's very critical. The people who are like masters of deep learning, they know, they know how long they have to train to get a certain result. Um, you don't want to end up like this guy here, right? You don't want to still wait, just wait, have more coffee and wait and wait and wait. You want to know when you, when you should look at stuff. Um, again, training curves is key. Training validation curves, always looking at these ones, having a live update of these. 
Um, there's also a big discussion about the architecture. Um, the most frequent mis mistake that I see is people look at, at a research paper, they see, oh, these guys used like a really big architecture. Um, this worked really well and then say, oh, I want to I wanna also use this cool architecture. It looks, sounds pretty good, right? Um, so this is mostly like then a super big network. They train for two weeks um, and they don't know what's happening in between. So biggest mistake ever, never start with a big network. Whenever you're starting simplest network possible. And it's interesting, I'm saying this every, every time, but every time people still make these mistakes. So after this class, I'm hoping when you're starting your own projects, please go ahead and start simple. So think about a network size. This is my, my rule of thumb. This is my rule I made up. Whenever you're thinking about an architecture, um, think about a simple architecture you have in mind and then divide the number of layers by five. That's typically how many, how many parameters you should start with at the beginning. You can still make the networks bigger later on, but for debugging and for checking that your validation error goes down at all, having a small network with maybe a few hundred K parameters, that's totally fine. Totally okay for most tasks. Um, if you're unsure, ask, but never start with big architectures from research papers because they are so painful to train. It takes forever to get anything out of them. Um, this is probably one of the most important advices um, that help you to get your iteration times down. It's all about getting iteration times down and making progress fast, basically. Okay, if you're talking about debugging, um, yeah, training validation test curves. I mean, that's the that, that's the thing you can look at, right? There's not so much else. Um, for generative models, you can look at outputs, um, but most of the time you're looking actually at your training validation test curves. You look at the loss curves and, and you also look at accuracy curves and stuff like that, right? Um, these are the things you're mostly using um, to debug. Um, another thing is only make one change at a time, right? So let's say you added four more layers, you doubled the training size, and you also trained longer. Now it's better. But which of these three changes made it better? That's something to, to consider, right? Um, yeah, typically what you do is you also don't train all the way through. You just make a few changes, you train for a bit, check your validation curves, uh, your, your loss curves, you, you overlay them and see which one works best, and then you continue with the parameters that work best. Okay. Um, yeah, a couple of implementation mistakes. You didn't overfit a single mini batch first. Always do that first. Again, <laughs> all this small model overfitting first. That's the simplest thing. You're not expecting to get anything out of it, but uh, in terms of performance, but you're expecting to figure out the implementation is correct. A um, couple of debugging things. I don't know. There's a lot of debugging things you can do wrong, of course. Um, common thing is um, we'll later talk about dropout. That's a regularization technique. You forgot to train, uh, forgot to toggle train evaluation mode, right? When you train, when you're evaluating in, in evaluation mode, sometimes things go very wrong, right? Um, and sorry, when you're evaluating and training mode, something goes wrong. Uh, zero audio gradients after every backward pass. That's also a common problem that often people happens. Um, often you pass softmax outputs to loss functions that expect straw logits. Um, I thought you're getting a warning nowadays, but um, yeah, that's also, these are the common, these are just a few problems. Um, I didn't bother to list too many. The problem is often they're very individual based on the problem statement. Um, but yeah, zero gradients is a standard one that a lot of people do. Okay, so these are common practices, um, how to get started with neural networks. And I told you, of course, a lot of things you should be careful about and not to do. Like, don't start with big networks. That's, that's my number one rule. Um, you wanna get, again, you wanna get intermediate debug results very, very quickly. Um, I wanted to mention a few tools. Um, this is more also a practical thing. Um, I guess we have a few minutes left uh, in this lecture. Um, typically, you have to visualize these training curves somehow. And, and there's actually pretty good curves that can help you with that. Um, and one of them I wanted to mention is TensorBoard. Um, I'm not gonna go into all the details. I mostly wanna mention that it exists and I would highly recommend to set it up for you. So there's basically a bunch of these visualization tools for these curves. Um, there's a couple of different ones. Um, so TensorBoard is the one I'm recommending. Most of my lab is using TensorBoard. You can use TensorBoard um, with TensorFlow or with PyTorch. They work with both. You can just set it up accordingly. And it's a, it's a fantastic tool to visualize, um, to visualize things. There's other ones. There's also Wisdom. I think Neptune is another one. Um, 
they all pretty much are the same, whatever. I mean, I'm not going into the details of arguing for one or the other. This is something you can figure out. Um, but I think it's very important to just check the raw functionality here. Um, so TensorFlow looks typically something like that. Um, so what you see is you have like, this is like typically a browser plugin, right? Uh, sorry, it runs in a web server and in your browser. And this one reads your log files, right? Um, that you're logging out during the training processes. And so here's typically, here's, a, here's an accuracy curve, right? The training progress, accuracy, loss, and the loss goes down. Um, and in this case, you're seeing also we have this smoothing parameter here that smooth is basically these curves here, right? Um, you can have multiple curves in one graph, so you can overlay training and validation. So in this case, if I look at the loss, well, my validation here has a higher loss than my training. This person here didn't evaluate the validation so frequently. I would recommend evaluating more frequently, like so the validation looks a little bit more like the training with the fluctuations. Uh, I don't know how much they smoothed it here. It's a bit hard to see. No, the smoothing is roughly the same here. Um, so yeah, I didn't evaluate it so much. Um, but you see immediately, okay, both of them go down, right? You can rescale the curves here. I mean, this is not, I don't have it running live right now, but you can basically rescale it here, right? Um, you see accuracy curves, you can have other runs you see at the same time, and you get a very quick overview in how well you're doing. So whenever you're doing like anything in deep learning, I would always recommend set up TensorBoard first. It's, it's just such a beautiful tool. It's just so great. It helps you to debug this kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I mentioned this one. You can compare different runs very quickly. You don't have to train till the very end. You're just in the middle of the run. You overlay your curves. Here you can select the experiments, right? Um, you can select different visualization properties. Uh, you can have um, all kinds of visualizations of the logs. I mean, basically what TensorBoard is doing, it's reading the log files. Um, as they're being written out by, by the deep learning frameworks, and then you can create these curves. Then you can overlay them together, um, and you can see what's respectively going on there. Um, like this run was better than that one, and then you can already cut off training, continue with the other one, and so on. Um, yeah, and the nice thing is, this is typically set up then on a service, right? Um, and you can, on your client, when you access your server, often what you have is you have an SSH connection to your deep learning server, and then you have, um, the browser uh, connection to, to the tensor port, right? Uh, you can also do things like visualization of model predictions for generative models. We'll later talk about this one a little bit more. Um, I would like to zoom in a bit, but you basically, for like GANs and, and autoencoders, you see that you can visualize the, the, the current outputs. And then you see every time you're doing a few iterations, you see like how it's generating new images and eventually you want to have like sharper images and stuff like that. So not just for loss curves, but it's also for stuff like, oh, intermediate uh, outputs for generative uh, uh, models or so. That's also very useful. So you see, oh, we'll later talk about stuff like mode collapse. We'll later talk about things um, like the blurriness factors and the realism and stuff like that. This is all something you can visualize here and you see it during the training process, right? Um, so often what you do is, you, you know, you just sit home and drink a coffee and then you check, oh, is my, is my training making any progress? Um, yeah, you can, um, you can visualize confusion matrices, a uh, very common thing, right? Um, you can, all of these kind of tricks is very nice, right? You, you see, oh, okay, well, I can read the numbers here, but it looks like the diagonal looks pretty good. <laughs> Diagonal should look pretty good in the confusion matrix. Um, you see which class is confused, which other class, right? All of these things you can set, set live, and you see it basically during the training, how this is uh, changing, and then you can also go back um, in the epochs, um, in the training status, and you see uh, how how did this how did this whole thing develop, right? Okay, you can compare different hyperparameter runs. Um, I don't know, you run it a couple of times, and you can also overlay these things. Um, again, I'm not advertising here TensorBoard, by well, I guess I'm advertising TensorBoard a little bit. I'm also saying that there's alternatives. I'm not like religious about let's use specifically TensorBoard. Um, all I'm saying, you need one of these tools to be effective at deep learning. Um, it's pretty, like, I also see this problem that people, like, they did, I've seen this too, like, they run research projects and they, like, for the first few months, they, they only look at console output. It's just so painful. You want to you wanna see nice curves and you want to wanna look at it, right? So that's why these tools, they're here, they're easy to use, um, and they can be directly integrated in, 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 in PyTorch or, or TensorFlow, right? Um, yeah, this is definitely something I would recommend to set up, and it's it's absolutely worth the effort spending a few days 
setting up your right visualizations for these curves. They, they just save you so much time later on. Okay, so I'm mostly through right now with the content. Um, I know today was a little bit of, uh, I hope I, I told you a little bit more practical things, right? It was less theoretical today. Um, but I hope it helps you to, you know, to get started. Again, like the starting simple paradigm is something you should really keep in mind, right? Neural networks, yes, it's about scaling, compute and stuff like that. But starting simple is really the key to success. Like setting the experiments up in a simple way, that's the most important thing. Um, in the next lecture, we're going to talk about more about training networks. Specifically, we're talking about loss functions a little bit, um, gradients, how they, how they can possibly vanish, um, the implications of activation functions. And one thing we will see, well, good, having good gradients during training is very important. I mean, that's one of the whole um, hopes. Um, and yeah, we're going to go into a bit more detail there. Um, also, I would encourage you of course, to look at the exercises. I hope um, this one is going well. Um, make use of the tools and the resources we're giving you. Um, again, ask the TAs, check, check on Moodle. If you have any questions, um, reach out to us. We know it's still difficult that we don't have physical lectures, um, but we're hoping we can help you at every, at every point here. And we still hope that you have a, a good experience when doing the exercises. Um, yeah, with, with all of that, I, I hope to see you um, again next week. Um, and of course, stay safe and stay healthy. So see you next week.